Good morning, everybody. We were rocking it. He wasn't, he wasn't kidding. I, I love when Trevor's back up here with us. We've been such a blessing jamming with him for years now and, and with Gabe as well. I, uh, when Trevor asked me to do this, um, I try to think of what could I offer. I'm not a theologian. Um, I'm not an educator. But I've spent my entire adult life dealing with tragedy. This sounds like it's going to be a downer, but it's actually, it's a victory message. But um, would you just help me open this with prayer? Father, I, uh, I'm humbled, Lord, and that I've been asked to speak, Father. Lord, we are your people. We're broken. We mess it up. But we have victory. Not by our might, but by yours. Lord, bless this message. Forgive the speaker his sins, for they are many. And may we hear Jesus and him only. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So before I start, being the retired law enforcement, I had to make sure I shared a safety message with you here. If you could put that picture up, Julie. No? Yeah. Yeah, balloon rides are canceled till further notice. Um, if you don't get that, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I recommend doing something safer like arm wrestling a bear or, you know, wrestling an alligator when you leave here. But um, that's my uh, version of Trevor's dad jokes that he starts out with. So. Yeah, I'll have to come back on that one. But um, When I was getting ready for this, I was sitting on the swing in my yard in the back talking to my wife and I said, "Hun, do you think I should introduce myself? I've been coming here since the late 80s. And I think I should because uh, some of you, and we, I'm amazed how many people are here, see me as a guitar guy back here. And the guy that can't sit still when the song's rocking, you know. Or I see myself in the video later and I'm like, oh geez. Um, my name is Larry O'Neill. Um, I grew up in a big steel town in Ohio. I was tell, talking to Tony last night about this. I went on uh, for a bike ride with my son Connor a couple days ago at night. It was awesome. And I looked at him and I realized, uh, you know, my, this is the only place he's ever known. I grew up in a big steel town in Ohio, 30 below zero, waiting for the school bus. Some of you could probably relate. And I looked at him and I said, Connor, what's it, what's it been like growing up as a keys kid? It just struck me on the, on the ride just how awesome it was. The moon was out, and he said, it's been awesome. And so it's, it's still surreal for me, 37 years later, that I have Keys kids and I have grandkids that are growing up here. So it's been an amazing thing. I, I grew up in a steel town in Ohio, um, in Youngstown, and I was raised Catholic. My dad uh, worked in a steel mill and sent three of us to parochial school, which if you've attended there, very expensive. And as I look back in retrospect, I, I still tell my dad thanks for how hard he worked to send us. We didn't have a lot of money, and I know it was a sacrifice for him, but to have a religious education for my dad was everything. Irish Catholic, if you're Irish Catholic or were, you get it. So when I, when I started thinking about what I was going to say, I thought about some of the, and when you hear the things that I speak about, I want you to know I'm not preaching from Sinai, I'm preaching to myself, of things that I've had to deal with, and I'm sure some of you have as well. And uh, let me tell you how I ended up at Island. Um, by the way, I was, in retrospect, I don't know if you've experienced this, but we could see many times in our life, in retrospect, where God was that we can't see at the time. That is a profound thing when that happens. So as I look back, and I've heard others say this to me, when I was confirmed in eighth grade, that's a thing that they do in the Catholic Church, 
something happened to me. I knew, but I didn't have language for it, that God loved me. I only see this now as I look back. I was always thinking about God. I wasn't behaving. Um, but somehow I knew that I was important to him in a really deep way. I didn't have the language for it. This is in reflection. Maybe you can relate on that, or maybe you, you went through a hard time. You didn't see where God was. Um, you know, I work for a, as a chaplain now covering three hospitals. I deal with tragedy every day. And I, I have others share the same thing with me. You know, I'm suffering now, but I see in the past where God was there for me. And I'll share with them, I'll say, he got you this far. He's not going to abandon you at the end. He told us we would have trouble. He wasn't kidding. And in that same sentence, Jesus says, but take heart, I've overcome all these things, including death. And I, I, I love this teaching, and I, I don't know where it came from or who authored it, but we live in the already and the not yet. We do have victory, and I'm going to share more about that. And Trevor prayed about it, and we sang about it. We do have victory. And then as I share with sometimes elderly patients that are suffering, I'm sorry that you're going through this. We have constant reminders this is not our permanent home. Things are broken. So I spent my whole life as, as a police officer, 33 years, dealing with tragedy. And actually, one of the guys that I worked with here was teasing me. He's like, so let me get this straight. You dealt with tragedy your whole life. Now you're a chaplain meeting with sometimes the dying people. What were you thinking? It's how I'm wired. God has been merciful to me, and I want others to know about it. It took me a long time to accept that I was valuable to God for a lot of reasons, and I know some of you have those. Some of you are in here, and the whole reason I put this message together is to the core of your being, you don't really know that God sees you as valuable. Fill in the blank for the reasons, abuse, your own sin, all of our sin, maybe a besetting sin, and you've counted yourself out. If you have put your faith in the Lord, that self-rejection is from the pit of hell that smells like smoke. That's not what he says about you. The debt has been paid in full. I love when Tony preaches tetelestai, an accounting term, paid in full. But I didn't, who, who tries to repay a debt that's stamped by the accountant, paid in full? Future daughter-in-law accountant over here. Let me tell you how I ended up here is, it's a very profound thing that happened. One of our sons had a serious spinal cord surgery back in the day. I don't think I even finished signing the uh, Island Community Church membership paperwork then. And somehow, Wayne Porter, who I, I kind of knew but not super well, drove to Miami Children's from here, stood next to us, bedside, and prayed for our son, who's now super healthy, 32 or 33 year old, I forget his age, but <laughs> I will never forget that. That's what kept me here. My wife dragged me here in 1988. If you look out by that palm tree, my heel marks are still out there. <laughs> and I was shown grace. It was very profound. It's, it's sometimes the simplest things, the act of love. I, I'll just never forget. He drove up there and didn't really know us and prayed. And my son, by the way, is totally healthy, recovered. That was an amazing thing. And that's what I've received here at this church, is grace. And that's the message of this church. I don't hear Trevor speaking Christianese. I don't speak Christianese. I think he keeps it real, and that's a blessing, because we do struggle. The two biggest surprises in my life, besides meeting my wife, which was awesome, when we were 19 years old or something, the two biggest surprises, that God was real, and two, that I was important to him. These are two profound things. If you, if you don't have that at the core of your being, then that's what we're going to talk about. 
you know, I was really grateful to hear uh, Trevor spend two weeks on mental illness. I deal with that all the time. I dealt it with as a police officer. Um, you know, as people of faith in the church, we can work hand in hand with mental illness. God works through relationships. I, I remember I had a professor, lifetime pastor, missionary in, in Israel. And we were talking about relationship. He said, Larry, God has been dealing with relationships since day one. He's the author of that. And he went to Genesis and he said, and he quoted, let us create man in our own image. Plural. Who's he speaking to? He's not speaking to himself. From day one, God has blessed us through relationship. And I've been blessed by relationships. I know that you have too. And I deal with that all the time where our relationships are part of healing. God works through us, works through others. Um, and this is something I deal with all the time. And I deal with all the time that people of faith, usually, don't know that they have value. I don't mean world value, that what the world says we have value because the next failure that we have that goes out the window. That's not how God sees us. Maybe that's a struggle for you. Maybe, maybe you were told your entire childhood that you were not valuable. Maybe you fill in the blank of whatever horror took place. I get it. I know we have folks that can't sing oh, Good, Good Father. Maybe you cringe when you sing it. I get it. I believe uh, that I am important to God, and I know that you are. And the Lord is merciful. And his mercy cannot be thwarted by our own failings for those that have put their faith in the Lord. This is not a revocable trust. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Psalm 103. Eight. I love that. I had to, when I went through some, you know, one of the hardest things I ever dealt with, and Tony was there for me and others, was when my, my dad passed away. Something happened to me. It was a, it was a really hard time. And I, I have to be honest, I kind of sunk into the abyss for a while. And... I had to make a decision, and I believe I was blessed by God and blessed by others through relationship. It occurred to me, and I've been hearing it my whole life in the church, I had to see what God has said already and believe that he, what he says about me. Sometimes it just comes down to I don't feel it. You know, John MacArthur says, our faith put in our feelings is a really poor place to put it. That's true. We don't feel it all the time. I share Psalm 6 with patients all the time. I'm paraphrasing. Where the author of most of the Psalms, chosen by God, called by God, a man after my own heart, says in Psalm 6, God, where are you? My bed is soaked with tears. I'm in agony. I'm paraphrasing. It's a long psalm. That is somebody God called a man after a mine heart. That's somebody that had his best soldier killed to cover up a scheme. Now, don't you think that God knew all the failures that he would have ahead of time? We are loved, and we will struggle. And I tell the patients, and they feel guilty when they tell me. I said, brother, don't feel guilty. That is the reality of living in a broken world. We're not in our permanent home yet. And I read Psalm 6. Some of them never heard that. Let yourself off the hook. None of us are walking on water here. Psalm 146. Oh, you know, I just realized I was doing this without glasses. That's, that's really scary. I'll give him the credit for that. Some of these scriptures that I've chose are, are God's character of eternal goodness and mercy. 
Now, you and I have been taught that our whole life. If you grew up in the church, I didn't really put it in my heart and carry it around until not that long ago. I believed it, and then it would fall away at my next fill-in-the-blank hardship. Psalm 145, the Lord is good to all, and his mercy over all that he has made, all that he has made. That would be you. And his word can be trusted in all areas of our lives. I kind of skipped this over, but um, I had to decide that what God said about me was true. You've heard this before, but this is an important passage. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. We can trust what is written. The two principles that I mentioned, that we are valuable to God, and he sees us as valuable, and it can be trusted to eternity. Those promises come from the faith in the Lord Jesus I started looking up some, some uh, scriptures for our perseverance and our eternal security, and I kind of forgot how many there were. I could spend an hour just reading them to you. It's an amazing thing. Perhaps you think it's revocable by whatever you have dealt with, by whatever you've been told. It says, God's love is eternal. And because of Christ, we will never be cast away, and we will persevere. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, Jude one fourteen. Or, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. I've heard Tony and Trevor both refer to that multiple times. As I reflect back on all the things that I've seen in my life and dealt with people that have hardship, I worked with teens for 12 years. If I had to come up with a common denominator, of the brokenness, amongst many other things, they don't know to the core of their being that they are valuable. They have no idea. They have good parents sometimes. I mean, we're all, I'm, I'm a dad, we, we fail. But they don't really know that they have value. And if, you, if we base it on what the world tells you, the value lasts about 30 seconds. I, uh, I put a devotional together Years ago, for a bunch of our chaplains, we do this internal training, and I decided, and I, I spoke about some of these things at FCA with Trevor, um, that was my message about our value, but if you can go ahead and show that, Julie, I'll, I'll go through each one. This is what God says about you, these are not my words, and other authors, it says, when I trust deeply that today God is truly with me and holds me in a safe, holds me safe in a divine embrace, guiding every one of my steps. I can let go of my anxious need to know how tomorrow will look or what will happen next month or next year. I can be fully where I am, pay attention to the many signs of God's love within me and around me. I don't know if you know who Father Henry Nowen is, but I'm, the devotional I'm reading now is a daily calendar devotional called You Are the Beloved by Henry Nowen. Go ahead, Julie. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's my grandson with one of his Many weaponries in the backyard. <laughs> okay. 
Go ahead. We all do this. Self-rejection is the greatest enemy of the spiritual life because it contradicts the sacred voice that calls us the beloved. Quotations. Being the beloved expresses the core truth of our existence, not because of what we say, but because of what God says. Because of the price that has been paid that does not need to be paid again. It's been paid. Next. Granddaughter. The lowly he sets on high, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. Job. My two pups, two of four. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you with my victorious right hand. Isaiah 41.10. I already read this, but this is an awesome passage. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purposes. It doesn't say that all things are good. This is a very comprehensive statement. That all things, he will work for good to those who love him according to his purpose. Go ahead. And I'm going to preach this to myself. We have to keep unmasking the world about you and I for what it is. Manipulative, controlling, power hungry, and in the long run, destructive. The world tells you many lies about who you are, and you simply have to be realistic enough to remind yourself of this. Every time you feel hurt, offended, or rejected, you have to dare, dare to say to yourself and myself, these feelings, strong as they may be, and they are, are not telling me the truth about myself because of who God is. The truth, even though I cannot feel it right now, is that I am the chosen child of God, precious in God's eyes, called to be loved from now until the end of the year, no, all eternity, and held safe in an everlasting brace. We are held safe in an everlasting brace because of Jesus. He has paid the penalty. Next. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. How many times in the Old Testament, New Testament, is God described as merciful? As Steve, one of my hero, earthly heroes besides the Apostle Paul and Tony and Trevor and many others. Is. I just lost my train of thought. Sorry. The Lord, the Lord, compassion. Oh, Steve Brown. Who, who he said, God has been trying to tell us from day one. Will you let me love you? We're not good at that. We're not good at that. We carry our, our failings around and our failures, our fears, anxiety, what's going to happen next? You know, I, I, I mentioned this earlier, and um, I'll mention it now before I forget. I have discovered over the years that these are things that we have to go to and practice. It's, it's not a take two verses and call me in the morning, and it's, let me go on to the next thing. I have to keep going back to this. The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love, faithfulness. Exodus 34, 6. Go ahead. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will never forget you. Go ahead. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss, yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is thy faithfulness. His mercies begin of 
fresh each morning. I had somebody tell me this week in Homestead, Larry, I never knew there'd be blessings in the book of Lamentations. I thought it was lamenting. And I thought of this slide that I, I put in there. I'll explain that picture in a little bit. Go ahead. One who has been touched by grace will no longer look on those who stray as, quote, those evil people. Those poor people who need our help. Nor must we search for signs of loveworthiness. Grace teaches us that God loves us because of, because of who God is, not because of who we are. That was, that was my struggle most of my adult life. I was, I was talking to Tony last night, and I said, let me tell you what my authority is to be up here and speak to anybody. Those that are forgiven much, love much. That's all I got. Go ahead. You like that mullet? 80s kid. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who, who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Thanks, Julie. I've dealt with a lot of, I was telling you I worked with teens for many years. Years ago, I was called to an incident of a kid that was kind of going off the rails. And I kind of had my defense up, as police do. We're getting ready. You don't know what you're going to walk into. Is it going to be chaos? We actually really do fear that I get in there and somebody's going to attack us, because it happens. So I have all these defenses up. And I had my own vision of what, what would, this kid would be about. And he was, he was train wrecking himself, and I spent few minutes with him and I realized within a couple of minutes this kid's really I see the gifts that he has that he doesn't see yet I see I already knew that he had value but I could see hope in him he was he, he didn't see any value in his life and I said after a while we were speaking and I sat down with him and we built up a little bit of a bond and I said do you know that you're a valuable person. Like you don't have to, what my wife calls settling for crumbs. You have value. You don't have to destroy yourself with the, you know, somebody told you you're worthless and you've been trying to prove them right your whole life. You don't have to do that. You don't have to settle for crumbs anymore. Has anybody told you that you're valuable? The reason I remember this kid, it was the most foreign concept he ever heard in his life. He looked at me, he's like, no. And he almost squinted like, What's this? This guy's nuts. He's, you know, he's in uniform talking about my value. What happened here? It was a most foreign concept in the world to him. And that was heartbreaking to me. And I just, I did what I had to do. And tried to encourage him and walk through it with him. You know, I, I came back and found him later and I brought him a, a T.D. Jakes book that talks about battling with past failures and who God and I can't remember the title now, this was like 15 years ago, and gave it to him. And then I heard that he messed something else up again and was gone. I don't know if you can relate to any of these things I'm saying to you. Maybe some of you in here, you love God, you're saved, and you've been trying to prove what your dad said about you. You've been trying to sabotage what God says about you, fill in the blank of what's happened to you. I'm sorry if, if somebody told you that you weren't valuable. You may have noticed that, uh, that we get saved and we, through the process of sanctification, some things stick. We're not in our permanent home yet. You might hear the tapes of your dad telling you're garbage. I get it. I've been hearing people tell me that for 40 years. They know who God is. They know what is Jesus has done for them but they go back into this self-condemnation or self-rejection this father now and speaks about. I dealt with that all the time. I, there's another story I wanted to share with you about value, and this broke my heart. I should have brought a Kleenex up for this one. I met with a woman who, who was a person of faith who could not stay sober. 
She loved God. And I came in the room, and it caught me off guard just to see the defeatism. It was so clear, the oppression on her face and her body. And she wanted to stay sober. I, I think, I don't even know if she had a place to live. And I was speaking to her, and I said, Do you know that you're worth more than gold to God? And she burst into sobbing. And I mean guttural sobbing. I don't know what somebody told her. I don't know what the message was that she got. But I would have told her it's a lie. What they said about you, what you're telling yourself, that's a lie. I went in my office and same reaction I'm having now. It just poured out of her body. She hated herself. She couldn't see where she was, that God thought she was awesome, that she's worth more than gold. Do you see yourself as worth more than gold? I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you did yesterday. That's what God says about you. We prayed together. I asked God to rescue her. I wanted sobriety for her so bad. I just cried out to God in my office. I had to take a break. I couldn't meet with anybody else for a while. She was worth more than gold. This is why this is such a passion of mine that people finally realize that we are people of value, not because of what we've done, because what because of what he has done. You know, I shared some of those in my, in my slideshow, some Old Testament. And I just wanted to give you a quote. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of John Piper, but I could spend a half hour talking about us as grafted in people, as Paul says. We are grafted in. Why, why am I showing you Old Testament verses? Because we are grafted in, and as Paul says, we Gentiles, those who put their faith in Christ, we now are of the circumcised. The promises of the Old and New Testament are our promises. As John says, Christians become the heirs of the promises in the Old Testament through union with Christ. That's how it happens. No other way. You know, I mentioned to you what, what happened to me when my dad died. Maybe you had a loss. When I went through that hard time and people blessed me with grace, it wasn't theological brilliance that helped me climb me back. All that, that is important. Just people just love me. Let people love you. Let God love you. You know, at the end of it, my wife said, what did you learn after all that? It just went on for a long time. And I couldn't speak. I just said, God loves me. I went through this dark time, as, as David said, where are you? And my bed was soaked with tears. Where'd you go? You know, I've shared with a couple people in here, Something that I say all the time, I believe it with my whole heart, God is not pacing the floor over you. Or face palming, gee, I had such high hopes for him. What, what? He's not pacing the floor. He knows where you are and he knows what to do. Let him love you. You know, I had a hard time forgiving myself for things and as some, I forget what pastor said, you know, the devil who is the accuser of the brethren day or night and the liar who accuses us, he usually has pretty good information. I want to talk to you about that you are secure and I am secure. I was telling Tony that guitar players often will share that we're not really a true original guitar player, that we borrow from other people that we respect. And that's true. I have a bunch of guitar heroes. Um, and I, I realized while I was putting this together, I have a bunch of faith heroes. 
people that I listened to. And one of the guys that was helpful for me uh, is a guy that was, he was doing healing ministries in South Florida, Clay McLean. And one of his passionate things, speaking about forgiveness and radical forgiveness and that we are held secure is a story of Manasseh. I don't know if you've heard this story. You could look it up. Second Chronicles 33, you could write it down. You don't have to go there now and look at it later. Let me read this to you. Manasseh reigns in Judah. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. And how many times do you hear this in the Old Testament? And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. According to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had broken down. And erected altars to the Baals. And made Azeroth. Azeroth poles. And worshipped all the hosts of the heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord. Of what the Lord had said, in Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of, Lord, of the Lord. You understand the, what has taken place here with the abomination to be a leader and to take the nation and turn it on its head and worship false gods. And he burned his sons as an offering in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Another translation says he caused his children to go through the fire. He burnt his own children in the sacrifice to false gods as the king. An abomination in the sight of the Lord. And he used fortune telling and omens and sorcery and dealt with mediums necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. That's not a good thing. Fast forward to uh, verse 10. The, and when Clay, I'll tell you a line that Clay always does when he reads this. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. In another, another translation says, and he, they would not hearken. Therefore, the Lord brought him upon the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, who captured Manassas with hooks and bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. And this clay says, well, that sounds like a great start. And when he, has, uh, Manasseh, was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord, his God, and humbled himself greatly before the Lord, the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. And then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Can you fathom this forgiveness that has taken place? He was forgiven. He caused his own children to go through the fire to a worthless God. Maybe you have some failures in your life. Welcome to the club. You know, one of my heroes, Steve Brown, tells a story. He's also a seminary professor. And he has these young men that come in, and they are gung-ho for righteousness and save the world. And those are good things. We want them to be energetic. And he'll take them aside, and he'll say, listen, you haven't lived long enough or sinned big enough to have an opinion on that topic yet. John MacArthur says, Perseverance attests to God's approval, for it gives evidence of eternal life, salvation. In other words, perseverance does not result in salvation and eternal life, but is itself the result and evidence of salvation and eternal life. God is not going to cast you away. I recall... One of the things that helped me, when, you know, when I, Dad died, is there was a series called "In the Grip of God." And John goes through this teaching and 
about our security and our perseverance, and he said to accept something else other than that as a believer is crowning the devil king who is the accuser of the brethren, Revelation 12.10, and a liar, John 8.44. That is not who your identity is. You have been, we have been paid, purchased by a high price. I have some things that I, I want to share with you that quotes that just really reach me from people and from verses about forgiveness. Forgiveness is worthly, worthless to us emotionally if we can't forgive ourselves. Or maybe, and that's why I started with value. If you don't know you have value, then you won't go to where there's mercy. We'll hide. It's not very smart to keep trying to do something you can't do and never will be able to do. Steve Brown. Talking about false guilt, the true guilt. It is no small thing to be loved when you're unlovable. <laughs> to be forgiven the unforgivable and to, so, to be supported when you've done nothing to deserve it or I have nothing to deserve. That's the gospel. It's the good news that while we're, there are those who might sacrifice for a good man or woman, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, that would be us. God shows his love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 6, and 8. I know it's one of Trevor's favorite passages. We talk about it all the time. I put a little arrow here, Trevor. While we were sinners, not after the act is cleaned up. I know you've heard the story before, but have you taken and put it on your heart and run with it? I, I'm preaching to myself. I mentioned it earlier in my slide, Romans 8, 28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, not that all things are good. For those who are called according to his purpose. <clears throat> Jeremiah Johnson says, what we are guaranteed in Romans 8, 28 is regardless of what we have to endure in this life, our eternity with him is unassailable. Nothing can stand in the way of his plans for our future glorification. As Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And in the midst of life's struggles, what better promise could we cling to? I just shared this with somebody this week. It was really important to them. They put it on their phone. God takes our sins, the past, present, and future, and dumps them into the sea and puts up a sign that says, no fishing allowed. <laughs> Corey Ten Boom. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove transgressions from transgressions from all of us. <laughs> Blessed be, this is a monumental passage. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. First Peter 1, 3 through 5. You know, one of the things that, that I remember hearing, it was really blessed me, was a point made by R.T. Kendall, where the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 3, 4 through 6. Then he talks about himself being a persecutor of the church. The Greek word for persecutor means to bring much violence to others. And then a few sentences later, Paul says, Not that I have already obtained this, or I am already perfect, but I press on to make my own, because Christ Jesus has made his own. Brothers, I do not consider that all I have made my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straying forward to what lies ahead. This is what R.T. Kendall says about that. I love this. He says, wait, wait, Paul. Do you realize what you just said? You're persecuting the church. That was pretty horrible. You killed people. 
There are people dead because of you. You lived to kill people because they were Christians. In one little sentence, phrase, persecuting the church, you admit that's in your past, and now quickly say, forgetting what's behind, how can you do that? And he says, because Paul believes what he's preaching, that he has been forgiven. I titled my message, Take the Blessing. I did an internship at Jackson Memorial Hospital as a chaplain. That was pretty scary. I felt safer responding to bank robberies than doing that training. And on my first day, I pull in the garage. If you've been to Jackson Memorial, it's a little chaotic. It takes a half hour to get in the building. The arm for the parking was up, and it said free parking. Well, you're supposed to get a token when you pull in by the arm going up. I didn't have a token. So I'm worried, this, how am I going to leave? I don't have a token. And I walked up to security guard. And I said, ma'am, I'm sorry to bother you. I just pulled into the parking thing and it says, uh, it's free. And she said, oh, chaplain, take the blessing. I said, what? Take the blessing. Yeah, but, uh, oh yeah, take the blessing. I said, I never heard that before. Can I use that? She said, yeah. The, it's a very simple statement, but the look on her face, she totally believed it. In the littlest of things, take the blessing. I told her, I'm going to use that. Go ahead, use it. So I wanted to ask you, will you take the blessing? That picture that you saw of me with an IV, Trevor spoke about it sometime before Christmas. I was going to two different gyms one day. I had my choice, and then a couple days later, I could barely walk up the steps. And I was diagnosed with a rare form of leukemia called APL. And you talk about having to believe what God says about me. And I realized this was very humbling. While I was there, I was in the room for 32 days and then outpatient. God's going to be good no matter what happens to me, and he loves me if I never leave here. That was very humbling. And I went into the bathroom of MCI after I had my diagnosis and burst into tears in the stall, and I asked God to rescue me. That was almost three years ago. Now, I'm humbled to say that to you because some of you have lost folks that didn't make it. I get it. I have people in my family who lost two fathers to leukemia. I'm just going to take the blessing and try to bless others with it. I'm not, I, I'm not going to beat myself up over it, which would have been my tendency years ago. <laughs> years ago, Tony did a service where he had a trash can up here and he had us all write down our biggest fear of some failure that we've had in our past that if it was put up on the screen we'd go to the Whale Harbor Bridge and jump off if it was known you are forgiven and I wanted to ask you will you take the blessing are you marching or are you dancing I spend most of my life marching Maybe you don't, you're not there yet. Can I just tell you that, and I tell patients this all the time, there is no more trustworthy person to pour your head out to God and to the Lord Jesus. That's the most trustworthy person. And you couldn't be in the presence of anybody safer. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what lie somebody told you. But I had to, I had to tell you what God says about you. Not me. It's what he says. Let's pray. Lord, I am not worthy to even speak your name in front of anybody. It's your grace that's brought me here. Father, those that are sinking in their seat because nobody told them they're valuable. And they've been trying to prove that person right their whole life. 
May they reach out to you, Lord, with abandon that you are the most trustworthy person that ever lived. That we are purchased. The price has been paid. It's paid in full. There will not be two crucifixions and resurrection. It's been good enough and will be good enough from here to eternity, Lord. May, may those that hear my word that are suffering cry out to you. May they take the blessing that you had a plan for since day one. I thank you for mercy and grace, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.